let's discuss medicine question of November Ames 2018 question number one the answer of this question is D peri anal anesthesia now why this the answer why not others let's learn the basic concept without of neuroanatomy here is the cerebrum this is central sulcus this is the motor sulcus and the uh, and this is central sulcus the part which lies in front of central sulcus is the motor cortex and the part which lies behind the central sulcus is central cortex and this is the leg area and this is the head area it means in the motor and sensory cortex the legs is legs are represented upside and the head is represented downward and this area is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery okay now this area extends on the medial side and this area is this part, particular part is known as para central labule this is the lateral view but this has more extension on the medial side so now this beautiful picture this is a medial side of the cerebral cortex and this is the you can say central sulcus and the part which lies in front of the motor cortex part which lies behind the central cortex and this is what we call as paracentral lobule now in addition to leg area they also have center which control micturation they also have center which control defecation also so if lesion is occurring on one side of the motor cortex that will lead to contralateral leg weakness but if both the paracentral lobules are involved there will be para weakness of both the legs or patient may even have paraplegia and of course as the as i told you paracentral lobule can control the micturations as well as defecation so in this case there will be difficulty in micturation incontinence will be there and there will be really fecal incontinence right now so with now we are and remember if both the legs are involved that will lead to problem in gait or what we call as gait apraxia or in advanced cases even if there may be complete paraplegia also but what about the option perianal anesthesia perianal anesthesia this thing typically occurs in conus medullaris syndrome what is conus medullaris syndrome let's learn the basic concept this is the lower end of spinal cord and here is the s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 fiber s1 2 3 4 5 same here in fact they are very closely packed fibers in conus medullaris syndrome a tumor or growth arises in the lower end of spinal cord and as the growth arises it will first involve s1 s2 fibers later on s3 s4 fiber now we all know these s234 fiber they are supply which supply the bladder as well as uh, as well as the s4 s5 s5 fiber they supply the perianal perianal area so that's why whenever we have a conus medullaris syndrome the, it will involve s5 and that's the, that lesion that will lead to peri uh, peri anal anesthesia loss of sensation and due to involvement of 2 3 4 bladder may be involved and the patient may present as urine retention patient say i am not able to pass urine so he will have feature just mimic, mimicking like benign prostatic hypertrophy or benign hypertrophy of prostate so that's why conus medullaris is a very important dd of benign prostatic hypertrophy but remember in conus medullaris there will be loss of perianal sensation and perianal sensation will be normal in bhp and one more thing 
It also, in Konus Metallurgy, there is involvement of S1 and S2 also. And we know very well, S1 is the one which is involved in, in ankle jerk. That's why, in case of, in case of Konus Metallurgy, ankle jerk may be lost because of involvement of S1. And this thing doesn't happen in benign prostatic hypertrophy. It means, if I have to conclude the thing, how to differentiate between BHP and Konus Medler is, remember both have same presentation, but in Konus Medler is, ankle jack will be lost and perianal sensation will be lost, and this will be present in benign prostatic hypertrophy. So I hope you are clear about the question number one. This was taken from my book of essence, I give you reference also. Right, now we talk about question number two. Which of the following cannot be diagnosed without positive ANA? The answer of this is A, again a question from medicine essence. Well, let us see how we diagnose a case of SLE. The diagnostic criteria of SLE, malar rash. It is a type of butterfly rash. Over the face, you can see it's a beautiful rash seen, butterfly rash. Discoid rash is seen on the arms. Photosensitivity, that means patient says when I go to sunlight, my problem increases. That's the basic idea of photosensitivity. Okay. Then, of course, a discoid rash in the, it, here it is seen in the cheeks. It can occur in the body also. Now, oral ulcer is the fourth feature of SLE. They are usually painless. Arthritis, it is non-erosive. What do you mean by non-erosive? That means there is no deformity. Patient has joint pains and when the pains disappear, the, uh, the joint becomes total normal, there is no deformity. This is a very, very important question. This is in contrast to rheumatoid arthritis where a lot of deformities are there. Polycirrhositis in this patient can have pleural effusion. Patient can have pericardial effusion. Patient can have ascites. The patient can have effusion in any of these cavities. Renal disorder is one of the most important. It can lead to hematuria. It can lead to renal failure also. Neurological disorder, it may include psychosis. It may include seizures or sometimes some focal deficit like hemiplegia can occur in these patients. Hematological disorder, because in these patients, they have autoantibodies against the RBCs, against the WBCs, and against the platelet. So they develop Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. Remember, because they have antibody against the, all the three cells lineage, and that lead to pancytopenia. But remember, it's all autoimmune. And once we have autoimmune process, steroid should be started very urgently. Now, after this, we have ANA is mandatory. ANA is the must. It's the most sensitive test. Then we have other antibodies, anti -DNA, double sided DNA, anti-SM antibody or anti-phospholipid antibody. So there are 11 criteria. Four or more than four is a criteria by which we diagnose SLE. But remember, this is a mandatory. ANA is, has to be there and that's why the question says which the following condition which cannot be diagnosed without ANA is SLE. Look at the question once again. Okay. Well, if you look question once again, Jogan syndrome, ANA may be positive, but it is not a very essential criteria to diagnose. What type of antibodies we have? In this, we have anti-RO, anti-LA antibodies. Are they in Jogan syndrome? In drug-induced ANA may or may not be there. Of course, the patient has lipoid feature and most of the time ANA is there. But it's a drug history that is more important. 
In scleroderma, ANA may be there, but remember, more specific antibodies are NT, SCL, 70 antibodies are there, or in a limited one, NT, centromere antibodies are there in Crest syndrome, and this is in systemic type of scleroderma, right? The best answer of this is E. Then we move on to next question, number three. Infertility in cartagenous syndrome. This is due to as uh, asthenozoosermia. What is this? In fact, before we go, I discuss this cartagenous syndrome. There are two things that you got to have in, you have to understand. In cartagenous syndrome, there is two main problem. One is situs invertus. That means all the body organ which normally lie on left side, they go to right side. That means the classical thing that we call as dextrocardia. Heart is on the right side. Same thing, there can be uh, inversion in the in the abdominal structure also. And second problem what we have in this case is, in case of cartagenous syndrome is ciliary, primary ciliary dismortality. Ciliary function are not there. And cilia are there in nose, airways, and sperms also, fallopian tube also. So now there is no, and of course I don't need to tell you that hair in the airways are meant to control the any infective material going into the airways. Since the nose doesn't have an effective ciliary movement, that leads to recurrent sinusitis. Airways, they lead to recurrent infection, recurrent uh, bronchitis, and ultimately they lead to bronchiectasis. Sperm count is normal, but ciliary movement is not there, what we call as asthenozoospermia. And similarly, in uh, fallopian tube, uh, the ciliary movement may not be there. That's why, due to these two reasons, patient has infertility. Right, so as such, there is no problem in sperm except ciliary movement. So now, if you look into other option of, so oligospermia is not a feature. Blockage of epididymis is not a feature of cartagenar. This typically occurs in tuberculosis. Okay, and undesynthesis is not a feature of cartagenar syndrome, so it will never contribute to, to infertility. And so that the best answer to this question is A. Question number four. Patient has come with cardiac tamponade. You are checking BP. What you should do? The answer to this is breathing normally. Why is it so? What is the importance of checking BP? So let's learn the basic concept. We all know. This the basic concept goes like this. This is the heart. And this is the pericardium. And in cardiac tamponade, fluid accumulate in the interstitium. And due to this reason, patient develop pulses paradoxes. What is pulses paradoxes? There is inspiratory fall of BP more than 10 millimeter of mercury. This is one of the very important feature of cardiac tamponade. Okay. So we want to LSA and this sign is we can see only when the patient is breathing normally. So that's why we ask the patient to breathe normally in this case. So you check the BP in suppose in expiration BP is 140, in inspiration BP is 126. This is expiration, this is inspiration. The fall of BP here is 14. That is more than 10 millimeter of mercury. So we are able to elicit pulses paradoxes. That's why 
patient should be always asked to breathe normally. Okay? So there is no point in shallow breathing, deep breathing or whole breath have no meaning because we are want to look for the very, very important sign which will, give, which will give a clinical clue to the case of cardiac tamponade. What else we can see in this patient in the case of acute cardiac tamponade? In fact, we get Bake's triad. Bake's triad is prominent JVP, low BP, and quiet heart. Quiet heart means when you are trying to auscultate, you, are, you can hear a nose heart sound or very distant heart sound. Why? As I told you, this is the myocardium, this is the pericardium, whole fluid is there. So heart sound are produced, being produced in the, in the heart, but it is full of liquid. And we all know that water is a bad conductor of sound. So we are not able to hear the sound. So we get a quiet heart in these cases. So that's why the classical tide, big tide, so muffled sound is a feature in this case. And of course, in addition to that, we learned about pulses, paroxysms there. Question number five. We got one lady who has got brachiocephalic weakness for one hour, BP 160 by 100, CT scan is normal. What you will do in this case? The answer of this is A. Okay. Now, you, you all must be thinking answer should be thrombolysis. This is the most common wrong answer. <coughs> Why this is the answer? Why not B? So let's analyze the case. First of all, she has one hour of the stroke. CT scan is normal. That indicates it is a ischemic stroke. Well, one more basic concept. Whenever a patient of stroke comes to you, what is the first investigation of choice? CT plane. Why CT plane? Why not contrast? First of all, you should know when we do CT scan in a acute stroke, in ischemic stroke, this C scan is normal. Then, but in hemorrhage, we can pick up the bleeding. And we also know that 85% cases of stroke are ischemic stroke. Now you are going to ask me a question. When we know that ischemic stroke, CT will be normal, then why we do? This is to rule out hemorrhage. And hemorrhage is better picked up by CT scan as compared to MRI. So that's why the first investigation of choice is CT scan like this in this case. It's normal and we are sure that we are dealing with ischemic stroke. Now, ischemic stroke has patient has come to us. And remember, it is one hour duration. It is an ideal candidate for thrombolysis, beyond doubt. His BP is not very high because if BP is more than 185 by 100 or 10, that is a contraindication for thrombolysis. Even BP is not that high, we can very well thrombolyze. But still my answer is aspirin or antiplated. Why is it so? Well, friends, this same question came two years back. In this, what they did, they asked the patient has come with acute pain chest, acute MI. And what you will do? You give aspirin, thrombolyze, PTCA, blah, blah. Answer is always antiplatelet. Why? The main problem of this is again a thrombotic or embolic phenomena, which is due to UD due to atherosclerosis. And remember, when we give aspirin, it action starts within one hour and it reduces mortality, both in coronary as well as CVA. Right? So and that's why it's always the first thing to be done. Still, you may not be convinced. Now let me answer the question to you. You are sitting here right now, maybe in your hospital or maybe in the hostel. 
somebody come to you, he got a patient, a patient brought to you, maybe in the casualty also, and CT scan done. CT scan is normal, but patient has some focal deficit, maybe hemiplegia. Can you do thrombolysis at the place where you are sitting? No way. Can you do in the emergency? No way. It is to be done in intensive care only. Thrombolysis is not done in OPD or in, uh, in the hospital or... Uh, but remember, aspirin or antiplatelet drug you can give immediately. That's why it's always the first choice. But AIMS examiner are very, very intelligent, very clever. They give a very nice clue that they diverted you to what? One hour the clue which you have diverted your attention to thrombolysis. But it's not that easy. The answer is aspirin and clopidogrel. Okay? So BP alone is not the first management. It has to be aspirin only. And no intervention needed is, of course, is the most common wrong answer. A patient with CVA, no thrombolysis, nothing to be done is never the answer. And of course, after that, we'll control, we'll control BP as well as thrombolysis. We'll definitely plan, definitely plan thrombolysis also. And the only thrombolytic agent we use is TPA. But thrombolysis is never the first choice. This question again from our, it's given in our question bank also. All are reference with page number I have given you. They are given. Now, cardiac axis is 90, R way will be maximum in answer is C. Again, a reference from our medicine essence question bank. So, let's learn how we really calculate the axis. If you have to calculate axis, we take L1, this is L1, and this is AVF. This is positive side of L1, negative side of L1. Positive size side of AF, negative side of AF. Now, let me tell you more basic concept. This is L, L1 and this is AVF. Any beat upward is positive, any beat downward is negative. So this, both are going up, they are positive. Let me see the how many small square. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I am getting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 positive for L1. And 5 positive for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 positive for AVF. The axis of this will be this is how we calculate axis. Axis is always calculated from this place. This is plus 45. Got it? Let me give you one more example. <clears throat> this is L1 is same. And now this is AVF. This is AVF. How many small? Now it's going down. Down is negative. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 negative. L1 is 5 positive. This was the first case. Now second case is this and this. 5 positive and here we are getting 5 negative. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now this is the axis. This is minus 45. Understood? Let's take one more case. This is L1 and this is AVF. AVF remains same. So that means L1 is negative, AF is positive. So how many small squares? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 negative, AVF is 5 positive. So now the axis become like this. Now the axis become from here. It become plus 135. And suppose this one is L1 and this one is AAVF. I hope by now I'm sure you will know how to calculate 
uh, access in this case. You can stop the video for a second and you try and then you see. Okay, start. So now L1 is negative 5, AVF is 5 negative. So the axis will be like this. This will be like this thing. Minus 135. Normal axis is from minus 30 to 100 degree. But I tell you, different books give different values by and large, but this is the most widely acceptable. So in that way, minus 30 plus 100, this is normal axis. And if it is below minus 30, we call it left axis deviation. And if it is more than 100, we call it the right axis deviation. Causes of right axis deviation are right axis deviation, left axis deviation, ASD, septum secundum, septum primum. Okay? Then left, this is right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block. Right ventricle hypertrophy, left ventricle hypertrophy. But very frequently asked, of course, this is very frequently asked question. And this is left pneumothorax. Right pneumothorax. Remember, when the pneumothorax occurs on the right side, it will push the heart to left side. If pneumothorax occurs on the left side, it will push the heart to, uh, to the right side. Okay? This is regarding. Now the question comes, what we have just learned. What about, now let us see this one. This is L1. This is AVF. In L1, 1, 2, 3, 3 up, 1, 2, 3 down. That means the height is 0. And AVF, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. AVF is 5. So now the axis is how much? 90 degree. That's why the question says that if the axis is 90 degree, the R wave will be getting in AVF. Because it's the AVF which is used to AVF and L1 are the two which we primarily use for to calculate axis. Well, arterial blood gas analysis, what is not done? The answer is flexion of the wrist is not done. Well, before of course we have to rinse the heparin with, uh, syringe with heparin. Why? If you do not do, the blood will clot immediately, be understood. We poke at 45 degree angle, yes, you can, uh, so that we can enter the artery in a comfortable way. And we do not damage any underlying structure also. We can't just prick into 90 degree. Suppose you are taking sample from radial artery. You, if you are not careful, you may just pierce the artery and can, can damage the underlying structure. So we do it. We never, if you flex the wrist, you will be never be able to take the sample. So it is not done. But what about LN test is mandated to do. So let's talk about LN test. What is done? Of course, we ask the patient to raise the hand. And after that, you compress radial artery as well as ulnar artery. You keep on pressing for some time and soon you find blanching of the hand occurs because you have occluded the main arterial supply. After that, you keep on pressing radial artery, but you release the ulnar artery. And in a normal person, the moment you release the ulnar artery, release the pressure from ulnar artery, this again becomes red. But if 
it is not red that means there is some problem in supply of the blood to the palm via ulnar artery that means only sole supply is radial artery so in that case we will never like to use this artery to take blood sample we may try at other arm or then in that case we like to go for femoral artery right so we want that means in nutshell what we want to know by allen test whether the ulnar artery is patent in supplying the artery if not then never use the radial artery or that's the only source of blood supply to arm if you are not careful you may damage the artery it can maybe any problem in that case the entire blood supply of the palm will go so go for the femoral artery next question number eight we get a patient of recurrent optic neuritis of both eyes with transverse myelitis equity is normal what is the answer the answer is NMO. What is NMO? I'll discuss shortly. Okay. NMO is again reference from our medicine essence only. Pages are given in all the questions. Also known as Davick syndrome. What is this? It is a variant of mitral stenosis. Oh, sorry, multiple sclerosis. So sorry, it's a slip of tongue multiple sclerosis right now it is a, a much more aggressive inflammatory disorder well, we also know that multiple sclerosis itself is a inflammatory disorder and in this NMO so called neuromyelitis optica typically occurs with acute optic neuritis ON is optic neuritis we all know that optic neuritis is a very very important feature of uh, multiple sclerosis and myelitis also the two thing we have in our patient right but what is special thing about in NMO the optic neuritis is bilateral bilateral optic neuritis is uncommon in multiple sclerosis okay. right of course, in NMO, it can be unilateral also, but in our question, it is bilateral. So, MS is ruled out. Myelitis is severe and transfers. It is never very severe in case of multiple sclerosis. And typically, the, in, regarding myelitis, typically, it includes uh, longitudinal extensive involvement, three or more contiguous vertebral segment. And this is not a feature of multiple sclerosis. That's why it is transfer myelitis is very severe and severe varieties there. Right? So there are features which are strongly indicating that it has got NMO. Now let us see other options, what we have in this case. Can it be subacute combined degeneration, which typically occurs in vitamin B12 deficiency? In vitamin B12 deficiency also patient can have optic neuritis, but it is never recurrent. Patient has a recurrent. And number two, in vitamin B12 deficiency, there is subacute combined degeneration. It does not lead to transverse myelitis. So this is not the answer. Because when we talk about subacute combined degeneration, there is involvement of posterior column and there is involvement of corticospinal tract. And in our case, is complete transfer myelitis is there. So this cannot be the feature. Posterior cerebral artery stroke, it involves the occipital lobe. That leads to cortical blindness. That means patient will not able to see, but his light reflex and accommodation reflex will be normal and of course optic neuritis is not a feature of of this uh, posterior stroke and neurosyphilis doesn't present with a type of recurrent optic neuritis hence out of all the option nmo is the best answer question number nine so we have one case of chronic kidney disease an ABG report shows 7.40 is the normal pH. 
CO2 40 normal, bicarb 25 normal, sodium 145 normal, chloride is normal. Everything is normal. So what's the answer? It's the answer of this question is D. Why it is the answer? But before I proceed further, let me tell you, this question I have discussed in my class, those of who, who have attended my class, the question number five, you can see, medicine test. Of course, this was lying down, but for easy visibility, uh, my computer staff has brought it up so that you can see it. This is question number five. You can go and check in your paper. Okay, now what is the special thing about this question? Why the answer is D? Why not something else? Well, everything is normal. It looks that it is a case total normal value, but one thing is the anion gap. Let's calculate anion gap. How we calculate anion gap? Sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. This comes out to be 145 minus 125. So anion gap is 20 in this case. Normal anion gap is 8 to 12. So definitely every report is normal except anion gap. And this happens in one condition where patient has metabolic acidosis with metabolic alkalosis. The, in chronic kidney disease, metabolic acidosis is common. And due to vomiting, he has metabolic alkalosis. Right? Hence, the best answer to this question is D. Question number 10. The cause of hyp uh, hypoxia, death due to smoke inhalation is, uh, answer is hypoxic hypoxia. Again, this question from our essence book, reference are given in all the questions with page number. In fact, before I discuss this question, let me tell you, tell you some basic concept. Normal PaO2 is 42, uh, normal PaO2 is 94 to 104. And whenever this goes to below 60, we call it to be hypoxia and we also call it to be respiratory failure. Okay, now what the mechanism of hypoxia? There are four different ways of hypoxia. One is decrease inspired PuO2. That is fractional inspiratory oxygen is reduced. Now what is FiO2? You should know this also. Normally we all breathe from the atmosphere and we take 21% is there in the atmospheric as uh, oxygen. For easy calculation I take 20. In the scale of 100, we are taking 20. In the scale of 1, we take 0.2 oxygen. This is FiO2. The normal FiO2 is 0.2. Okay? Now, somebody is inhaling smoke. Definitely, smoke contains less oxygen. Right? So, definitely, patient will develop, reduce inspiratory oxygen. And that's the cause of hypoxia. And that's the cause of death. And of course, one more thing. If severe smoke inhalation occur, that can induce ARDS. Okay, acute respiratory distress syndrome. That is That carries a very high mortality. So that's why in smoke inhalation, hypoxic hypoxia occur. Let us see what are the other causes of hypoxia. Hypoventilation. That means the uh, this breathing effort is less. This may be due to neuromuscular junction disease like myasthenic gravies, maybe polio also, drug overdose, which lead to secondary respiratory depression, typically anesthesia overdose, drugs overdose, shunt, any shunt, maybe intrapulmonary or intracardiac, where blood goes directly from artery to vein, bypassing the lungs, or V2 mismatch, typically asthma, COPD, or interstitial airway disease, in all these ventilation, perfusion, uh, because the mismatch is there and that's the reason hypoxia but of course now the question is cause of smoke it is hypoxic hypoxia well we got one ECG let us see patient has sudden onset of breathlessness ECG shows like this 
let's see one by one. Is it AF is possible? In AF, P wave is not there. But in our case, we are definitely getting P wave. So this cannot be atrial fibrillation. In sinus arrhythmia, the heart rate changes with respiration. But here there is no such change available. This cannot be sinus arrhythmia. In acute MI, we get definitely EC changes. Let us see what are the EC changes in acute MI. This is normal recording. T wave. In acute MI, first finding is tall T wave. This is a tall T wave. This occurs within minutes of acute MI. After that, you get ST segment elevation. And this occurs in 2 to 4 hours. After that, we get T wave inversion, 8 to 12 hours. And after that, you give Q wave. This you get in 1 to 2 days. Okay, 1 to 2 days. Right? So we are not getting any change like this. This cannot be acute MI. PAT is paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. PAT, proximal atrial tachycardia, which is usually of sudden onset. And in this case, atrial discharge rate is in the range of 150 to 225. Usually, 150 to 200, 220 or 230 is the atrial rate. Now, in this case, let's calculate the heart rate. 1500, how we calculate heart rate? 1500 divided by number of small square between two R wave. So R wave, R wave, if you see, it is around, if you calculate the heart rate, in this case, we are getting 10 small square. 150 is the heart rate. Hence, the best answer to this question is PAT is the best answer. Now, how do you treat this case? We can, uh, we can treat by giving injection adenosine. It's a very short-acting drug, or we can give injection as molol. Again, a very short-acting and quick-acting drug. These two drugs we use to treat acute PAT. But for maintenance therapy, we can use drug like verapamil. We can use digoxin, or we can use any beta blocker. So hence, the answer to this question is uh, D. Again, a question from our medicine essence. Question number 12. We got one patient with thalassemia to whom we are giving blood transfusion and patient developed severe backache and looked very anxious. What is the next management? Answer is stop BT. Blood transfusion. BT is blood transfusion. Okay, do not confuse this with the bleeding time. To so stop blood transfusion is the answer. Why? First of all, why he has this problem? This is the classical feature of mismatch blood transfusion. That means patient is a patient must be having blood group of B and somebody by mistake has given the blood group of A. That's the reason. And this happened within minutes of starting blood transfusion. And during blood, uh, mismatch blood transfusion, patient complain of severe backaches, become very un unsure, unconscious uh, is the what, what we have in mismatch. So in that case, no doubt about it, first thing is to stop the bleeding, uh, uh, blood transfusion, not bleeding, blood transfusion. Okay? In fact, it's a very common sense question. It doesn't need a much high fi knowledge of medicine. Even a trained nurse will come to know that mismatch is going on, stop the bl uh, blood transfusion immediately. Let's look at the other options. Continue blood transfusion, do ECG? No way. If already mismatch is going on and you keep on doing and do ECG, you will, the patient will die in very, very short time. So this is not the answer. Stop BT, good idea. Wait for patient to get normal, restart. I think this is the most stupid thing what a doctor or a nurse will do in the ward. 
we already we have come to know that patient has mismatch you restart that means you are really pushing the patient to death no way do clerical checks clerical checks to done later on first save the patient so no doubt that the best answer to this question is a okay question 13 friends this is the uh, oh, well this is aims question they're all memory based recall and this question we got from student and in fact this question is is being circulated in the social media all social media this question is available but I'm sorry to say it's a wrong question it's a wrongly framed question but now you are going to ask me why I'm showing you because the same question you must be having in your social media or maybe print out this now what is the what the problem let me tell you what is Kidigo Kidigo is a criteria to diagnose a case of acute kidney injury AKI is acute kidney kidney injury is the new name of acute renal failure it's a diagnostic criteria and rifle is a staging criteria there are two different things you cannot say who is a better player is it Sachin Tandulkar is a better player or or Federer is a better player he is a cricketer and he is a tennis player you can't compare the two same thing this is a staging criteria and this is a uh, diagnostic criteria now definitely you like to know what the right question the right question should have been like this okay I'll the right question should have been like this what is the difference between the Kidigo and Akin criteria these are the two criteria to diagnose acute kidney injury maybe in the exam it may be Akin okay now the criteria are urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than 6 hour increase in creatinine more than 0.3 mg per, per DL within 2 days rise in creatinine more than 50% from baseline within 7 days need to renal replacement therapy for more than 4 weeks now this is the question I, you can stop the video for a second and you can note down the question also and you see what the answer okay and then you check the answer right <clears throat> so now I presume you have written the answer also the right answer is rise in creatinine more than C the right answer remember in both Kidigo, KD, uh, Kidigo and Akin criteria A, B and D are same the only difference is C in Kidigo rise in created is based on within two days in Akin this same is in seven days so I hope now you are much wiser as, as compared to you got a new information right you are ended by some new extra information now of course I'll discuss staging of a rifle also rifle I told you is a staging criteria they were the diagnostic criteria as I, as I told you that a ARF the new name is AKI, AKI AKI is acute kidney injury the new name but still many books they do write about ARF so I have mentioned both staging as I told you rifle criteria so we have a rise R injury failure loss and stage renal disease that that's the reason why we call it to be a rifle criteria R I F L E is the criteria so let us see what are the criteria is when you say risk is there risk is there if creatinine rises more than 1.5 times or urine less than 0.5 ml for 6 hours is risk injury double of creatinine or urine production less than 0.5 ml in 12 hours failure triple of creatinine and urine output less than 0.3 ml per kg loss kidney function loss for four weeks and state renal disease kidney function loss for 12 weeks okay so now it looks a little difficult but I'll make it very simple for you look at creatinine creatinine 
डबल इज एंड ट्रिपल तो 1.5 टू 3 किडनी फंक्शन लॉस फॉर फोर वीक्स ट्वेल्व वीक्स इज एंड स्टे रीनर डिजीज तो कैरी होम मैसेज फॉर यू इज पॉइंट वन पॉइंट फाइव टू थ्री फोर ट्वेल्व इज द समरी आई थिंक यू कैन रिमेम्बर इट वेरी इजली द राइफल क्राइटेरिया थैंक यू वेरी मच